Hi, and welcome to this Angles Special Issue entitled The Cultures and Politics of Leisure in the British Isles and the United States. Welcome to Angles. Let us first give you an indication of what the volume is all about. How does one pin down leisure? You could think of water, for instance. Leisure could be watching the flow of water and indulge in daydreaming. Or it could be about swimming or sailing. That's fun, all right, indeed. But there's more to leisure than meets the eye. There's class, there's identity, there's politics. And that is what the volume will want to highlight. Leisure raises central issue about culture and politics. Indeed. The divide between leisure and productive work, to which it is traditionally opposed, has never been an impassable wall, but rather a porous boundary involving dynamics of control, negotiation, and hybridization. Far from a mere holiday or retreat from society, leisure represents a specific domain of activities in which core social and cultural values and structures are expressed, reified, transmitted, learned, manipulated, and resisted. Cultural historian Johann Huizing found play to be productive of a culture, while sociologist Irving Goffman viewed games as world-building activities. Psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott referred to play as the locus of the cultural experience, and anthropologist Clifford Geertz borrowed Jeremy Bentham's concept of deep play to convey the high stakes that certain leisure activities can hold for their participants. Leisure and play have, throughout history, intersected with issues of cultural identity, gender norms, political engagement, or labor regimes in both Britain and the United States. Now on to the articles themselves. We've decided to divide them into two groups. On the one hand, leisure, public engagement and shared communities. And on the other hand, B, the work leisure frontier, tourism, gambling, gardening and surfing the web as objects of control, discipline and legislation. Now let's look at the first part, which brings together five contributions. First, we take a plunge in the wonders of leisure and sports, with Olaf Stieglitz. Stieglitz analyzes the role of the illustrated press in promoting swimming as a physical activity for women, notably the development of a new swimming style, the crawl, which allows him to trace changes in gender norms of beauty, performance and public behavior. Then we move on with Michael Stewart Foley and Martin Rambutz with an examination of the role of fun as a form of political engagement in the punk subculture of the late 1970s. San Francisco punks carved out a never expanding space for participation and engagement, promoting an alternative lifestyle which escaped the grip of commercial capitalism while reserving ample time for leisure and political engagement. And we continue along the same line with Mathilde Bertrand. Mathilde Bertrand argues that the British community arts movement in the 1970s and 80s took on a decidedly collective dimension with imaginative activities, channeling energies, in order to take, to trigger, collective action on issues affecting people's lives. Equally collective is Simon Roberts' endeavour, as shown by Karine Chamfort. She shows, with the Simon Roberts project, how traditional leisure, such as hiking, paragliding, angling, bathing and sea bathing, are processed into pictures of English life. Not just because these activities themselves are quintessentially English, which they're not in fact, but because of the way Roberts has premised his work on a public consultation, taking into account the public suggestions and feedback as he was making his We English series. Contemporary British leisure is further widened by Sarah Picard. 
as she examines the legitimacy of considering young people's political activism as leisure per se, with a theoretical framework of serious leisure. She establishes that involvement in collective action does count as leisure, and she revokes the assumption that leisure is all about pleasure and hedonism. The second theme is B, the work leisure frontier. Tourism, gambling, gardening, and surfing the web as objects of control, discipline, and legislation. Suzanne Bertifogla explores how natives were quick to capitalize on tourists' perceptions of native culture as a rejuvenating antidote to modernity, using visitors' appetite for all things Indian to resist acculturation efforts at the hands of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. She belies, at least in part, traditional takes on the necessarily exploitative and colonial dimension of cultural tourism. At about the same time in Britain, Betting became the focus of attention of the British government in an effort to curb illegal practices. Emmanuel Houdot explores the limits of political legislation and an age-old practice which served very lucrative commercial ventures. Arnaud Page provides an historiographical review of the study of Lutton gardening in Britain at the turn of the 20th century. He shows how Lutton gardening as a form of leisure had always served a political, social, and cultural purpose in the light of governmental policies which framed gardening as an ideal leisure for the poor to balance off the weight of labor. Olivier Fressé highlights the rise of consumerism, namely when users' leisure time activities are used as a source of profit for corporations, effectively making users co-producers of goods and services. While corporations have long sought to profit from their workers' leisure time and provided them with activities especially compatible with their professional life, American corporations have harnessed new technologies and media platforms that not only blur the distinction between work and leisure by accommodating them both, but now allow them to rely on the work of amateurs. We hope you enjoy this issue. <laughs>